everyone. Hi, Joe. Hi, Dr. Joe. How are you doing? Doing well. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come join us for our second uh, finalist candidate uh, for the position of Vice President of Academic Affairs. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Terry Harper to you. Most of you know Terry. She has been serving as the Interim Vice President of Academic Affairs for about a year and a half. Prior to that, she uh, served as the role of Dean of Health Science and Wellness. And prior to that, we stole her away from uh, Michigan to come out here. She was at uh, Ferris State. But since you know her, and since I know that she's got a lot to share with you, I won't do any more of the introductions. But if you would at least uh, uh, join me in welcoming Terry, and thank you for being here. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Joe, for that wonderful introduction. And I do look across. Uh, this room and see lots of familiar faces and, and that's really helpful for me. So thank you for your attendance and I hope this is enlightening. So we're really talking about leadership and the role that I will play as the permanent vice president of academic affairs. And um, I wanted to touch on some components of who I am that some of you may not know uh, about me. So the first uh, leadership area, growth and development, and by the way, hi ACC folks. Um, I didn't get a chance to, to say hi to you. Um, but I have a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, and I got that from the University of Michigan. And I put that there because I think it is a critical uh, competency, a critical program that I was involved with and completed and practiced in over uh, the course of uh, my career. And I want to call out this idea about the nursing process because um, some of you that don't know about the nursing process, probably don't have an understanding of how closely aligned it is with quality improvement, plan, do, check, act. Um, that's how we work within the um, structure of nursing. And so I think that really helps a lot with the training that I have and uh, the work that I have done. Other uh, growth and development opportunities at Ferris State University, I was a faculty member there. I taught in the nursing programs in the healthcare core curriculum programs and healthcare systems administration program. And so that gave me a very good academic background uh, to learn the way the system works, uh, to understand pedagogy, uh, understand how classrooms work, how students work, and the other relationships within the university setting. Uh, while at Ferris State, I became the healthcare uh, systems administration program director. And that provided even more opportunity for me to understand the organizational structure, but also um, so much of what's required when you're developing good programs and making sure that you have um, the design necessary, the feedback from your other hospital organizations and institutions um, to say this is what the curriculum needs to teach our students. This is what they need to know when they walk in after graduation. So very important, that's where I got my um, baptism with program review and uh, really appreciated what I learned in that capacity. And that's also um, where I was doing a lot of data collection because it was a mandatory part of our advisory committee reporting. Uh, some of you don't know, but I was the Big Rapids City Commissioner for eight years. So that is an elected position. It's a four-year term, and I was elected two times for that particular position. I believe it really enhanced who I am and what my skill set is, because um, I represented a constituency in that particular city. And I had to make decisions about budget. I had to make decisions about new policies and procedures. And some of those decisions that we made um, did not result in happy outcomes. If we had to raise taxes, we typically saw a room this full or fuller with individuals that were upset with the decisions that we had just made. And so it required that we were able to um, manage those conversations, that we were able to articulate the necessity of those difficult decisions that were being made. And of course, um, we also had semi-judicial hearings. Uh, this is interesting, and, and Big Rapids, Michigan, you can look this up later. Um, our attorney spearheaded an ordinance called the Padlock Ordinance. 
and it was very controversial and it was the first in the nation. And because this is where Ferris State University is located in the small city of Big Rapids, as you can imagine, we have a, an enrollment that matches UW's enrollment, about 12,000 students. And so we have lots of Thursday night, Friday night partying going on, and um, residents would get very upset. And so we would have a lot of situations where we had these R1 districts, if anybody's familiar with zoning, and R1 districts is where a single family is allowed to live. But we would have absentee <laughs> landlords who would rent in an R1 district single family occupancy to students. And so they would have four or five, six students in these homes and they would have lots of parties and the poor neighbors would complain. And so this padlock ordinance actually gave the city commission the authority to be able to review the evidence and place a padlock on that home. And that padlock would stay in place for six months. And you can imagine if when we made those decisions, the landlords were not very happy. That was um, six months of rental income that they wouldn't get. And it was done um, with an evidence-based perspective, uh, but it was a semi-judicial type of um, operation that we were running with that. So uh, wonderful experience with that, and of course, fiscal accountability. I also received a certificate in total quality management from Ferris State University. I'm very proud of that. I'm mentioning a two of the top two gurus in um, uh, CQI, and so I think most folks are, may recall Edward Nemings. Um, but I like to just uh, highlight a couple of their key components of their philosophies. And, and for Deming's philosophy, it was break down barriers. And I think that's just so <laughs> critical. And, and we talk about that a lot at, at this institution. It's not an uncommon conversation um, throughout many organizations. We tend to feel siloed. We're all doing very specialized work. And the key, as Deming pointed out, is to make sure that we are communicating across lines so that decisions that we make are more broadly and fully understood. He also said improve constantly and forever. So I'll let you ponder that one for a bit. I don't think I need to say much more on that. Uh, Joseph Duran said identify the needs that you have and, and then begin to develop processes. And I think that we've all experienced a lot of that um, on campus with the, the types of uh, directions we need to go. It's here's our need, what is the process for moving forward, what is that plan of action, let's go ahead and implement it, and now let's analyze that, review it, let's optimize the process. Maybe it requires streamlining, maybe it requires a different, different forms, um, maybe it requires a whole different communication structure. So this has very much influenced who I am. Um, finally, this really speaks to my time here at Alfred Booksy. Uh, I came here and became the Dean for Health Science Wellness. At the time, we had about 10 programs, a budget of almost a million dollars. And subsequent to that, the interim VPAA, um, oh, 70 programs. We started out with a few more, and if you recall Program Revolution, we kind of downsized or right-sized um, and overseeing a budget of about $5 million. So, uh, when I think about leadership and what's critical, we have to refer to our strategic plan. That is essential. And we have a very well um, developed strategic plan. Uh, if you know me, I like to shorten things and condense them into manageable pieces of information. So, completion agendas. That's strategic goal number one. Improving student transitions, strategic goal number two. Three, thriving into the future, organizationally, uh, culture, all of what we need to do to make sure that we uh, have created something that's sustainable and something that's going to fulfill our mission. And finally, physical transformed college. And I like to loop on our academic goals <laughs> to this because I think that that's the other critical piece. And um, for those of you who are um, faculty, you've seen this because the deans have shared this out with you already. 
uh, and we launched this. That was a collaborative effort with the academic leadership team. What do we need to focus on this year? And we said academic master planning. When you think about it, we have a strategic plan. Um, many of you may have realized we just finished looking and, and revising our master plan. Um, so we had a lot of feedback on what's going to happen in certain areas, science, building, and so on. What we don't have clearly articulated at this point is an academic master plan. You know, where do we want to be in the future? What are our key programs? Where are our growth areas? How does enrollment fit into that? How does our physical structure fit into that? Um, do we need to be looking at different spaces that, as of yet, are unidentified for possible growth areas for new programs that we might want to launch? Data application is the next area that the academic leadership team chose to focus on as a goal this year. And I think that you've seen some of the results of this already. Uh, we've been talking about um, course success rates. We've been taking a look at um, our systems as far as we compare with our sister colleges across the state. Um, the deans have been working with the CSI data and saying if we have biology 1010 and we know what our course success rates are for our institution, how does that compare to the other community colleges? Is there something we could learn from them if they have better results than us? Um, is there something that we need to talk with those folks about to help us improve and encouraging those conversations? Uh, strategic enrollment, scheduling, and management. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the new scheduling matrix? Raise your hands. New scheduling matrix. Okay. Um, this is... Oh, thank you, Stacy. <laughs> we had one quiet clap going in the background. Um, this is something that we're rolling out based on multiple concerns. Um, concerns of uh, students that they're not able to get the courses they need. Um, we're concerned about the fact that um, we oftentimes, uh, and, and this is actually data that came out of our master plan uh, information that said, you know, guess what? We're technically utilizing only the time frames from about nine to one really efficiently on this campus. You know, how, how can we change that? We know that students um, are here for longer periods of time and we know that the infrastructure is in place and we, we have to have that infrastructure ready and available. Why don't we come up with a matrix that helps students <coughs> as they're looking at how their schedule will work out and they have to make adjustments that they always can count on consistent start times, consistent time frames. And one of the keys that we implemented with this um, scheduling matrix, which I think there was a little bit of heartburn on the folks, um, on some of the folks when they gave us feedback on that, but that is on Tuesday and Thursday, when possible, courses won't be scheduled um, at 11 o'clock. And that was done very intentionally to say from 11 o'clock to I believe it's about the 1230 time frame. We want to have that be an open hour. Um, I came from an institution where that was uh, utilized and I know of other institutions that utilize it. When we work with faculty, one of the biggest concerns <coughs> they have is I would love to serve on this committee, but I can't find a time frame in which to meet with you to do that work. Um, and so this provides that opportunity to say, let's schedule meetings then. School meetings, department meetings. Um, it's a Tuesday and Thursday. So it, it gives at least three hours every week where hopefully there are no competing types of um, activities in place at that point except for lunch. And um, certainly we can all share a brown bag and, and um, talk about what we need to do. Finally, efficiency. Uh, we want to sustain our core mission. And so we said it is very important for us to have a goal that we look at our processes, procedures, structures. How can we be more efficient? So um, the areas I want to kind of explore at this point is a strategic goal number one. Remember, that's that completion goal. 
Right now, we already have seen an increase of 19%, and that actually takes into account those 810 degrees that were earned over the academic year 15-16. So we're seeing an increase in the number of our credentials earned. That's important, and we will need to sustain that. Uh, we have a goal in mind that we need to meet, and so we'll have to continue to work on that. But as part of the completion agenda, we need to make sure that the, the quality of our programming is, is at the best it can be. And so that's a critical place that we look at. We want to make sure that we have good enrollment. We want to make sure that the programs that we're offering actually translate into jobs, if that's what they're created for, or transfer. We want to make sure that what we offer is affordable, and we heard Laura Nichols say that UW is one of the most affordable four-year universities in the nation. We are a very affordable community college. So we're doing really well on that. We want to make sure that we're completing, or that our students are completing those degrees with less time. And so that leads into one of those areas that um, I was asked to specifically discuss that I have worked on. And I chose completion and curricular redesign because I think um, that exemplifies a huge process. It exemplifies the necessity of working with many different individuals and many different processes to ultimately get the results that we had. And we knew that it was primarily driven by policy and procedural changes. Okay. Our policy and procedure as well as our um, uh, degree and certificate policy and procedure, we had to get the number of credits down, which meant we had to completely modify our programs to make sure that they fit and were compliant with our policy and procedures. So we looked at all of that. Um, the a academic standards team, how many of you are on the academic standards team? Raise your hands. This is a very robust group. They are dedicated, they are committed, they do a lot of hard work. They're not only meeting on a regular be basis for at least a couple of hours, but they do a lot of work behind the scenes with review. And so it is one of our um, very important uh, cross-campus teams that collaborate on making sure that our curriculum is the best it should be. In any case, I was the co-chair of the academic standards team for a little over a year. We looked at various structural enhancements that had to occur, form development process, education and training. So we had to look at norming. When we're reviewing programs and we're using that documentation to identify what is correct and what isn't, what we would recommend for changes, we had to sit down with folks and talk about what that would look like and run through some um, prep examples of that. Course coordination, um, a critical component of that. Registrar, critical component. Uh, financial aid, critical component. Advising, critical component. When you talk about curriculum, it touches so many areas. And so it was so important to have lots of folks involved in the process and helping us along the way. Here's the results, and I'm not going to go over those and repeat them because I think everybody um, looks familiar enough that you're fully aware of what happened uh, with the uh, completion uh, for program redesign. Some of the strategies that we used were administrative strategies. It's making sure that we have good folks in place. That's one of the questions I was asked to talk about. How do you choose? Uh, who will be team leaders. Um, you need to look at those folks and what, their, what assets and talents they have so that you can strategically choose them to head some of those committees and do that hard work. Um, anybody that remembers Crystal Stratton as the chair knows that she put in countless hours because at the time, this was all hand-processed information. So a lot of hours put in to make this system work. Um, Cross-campus communication talked about that. Management system, curriculum um, system, again, we did not, we had a curriculum management system. We just weren't ready to use that system. 
And so over the course of time, we've now got that system up and running. And I think most folks that are using it would say, while it may not be the best answer to what our needs are, it is still working well for tracking and documentation. And so um, we have made a lot of great strides with that. I want to point out on this bottom line here, unintended consequences. Uh, because with any type of initiative you launch, um, when you first roll it out, you never realize uh, the impacts of some things. And, and we found something uh, with our foundation when we inactivated a program. The foundation, and we never thought to include anybody from the foundation in this academic standards process. But it was only after the fact that we had discontinued a particular program that we heard from the foundation saying, hey, what happened to this? We collect money from this for this program. We have a donor for this program. Well, we were able to salvage that situation because actually um, the program itself didn't disappear. It was a change in the program's name. And so everything worked out very well with that. But you never know sometimes what types of uh, consequences can occur. And so we need to uh, keep that as part of our planning structure. What could happen if we do this? Let's, let's brainstorm, think about it. Um, if there's things we can address early and be proactive about it, let's do it. <coughs> Developing processes, again, looking at handbooks, process maps, um, educational opportunities, training. <coughs> These are all the types of activities that when you are going to be in a leadership role, you need to be able to be managing and making sure that you're providing what folks need in order to be able to do the work that they need to do. So some more leadership strategies that just branch off this that I think you may need to know about what I do and, and how it affects the college. Um, I am a member of the Academic Affairs Council and that in, involves all of the vice presidents from all of our sister colleges. And we look at a lot of the larger issues that affect curriculum and program. Um, programs across the state. So one of the things that we just completed, one of the initiatives is um, redefining our certificate de um, uh, uh, definitions. So we spent a lot of time talking about that. You know, does, should we have um, certificates that are less than 16 credits? Because Julie Wilson will tell you that you need to have those 16 credits in order to make it um, financially aid applicable. And so should we be offering something less than that? Is there value in that? And if so, what it, could it be? So we have lots of discussions related to that. Because of my work with the Academic Standards Committee and the development of review check sheets, I took that template forward to Academic Affairs Council and said, you know, We've had some issues with um, the approval process at this level. Uh, some folks would say that we just basically rubber stamp things as they come through, and it's not truly vetted at a level that demonstrates folks have asked tough questions and understand what's going to happen. So we adopted that review check sheet. That's what we use now. And so we actually have a process where we can communicate to each other where there's concerns, communicate to that vice president from the originating college where there's concerns and they can address those concerns and provide answers. Um, proposed and expedited, uh, proposed and expedited um, approval for embedded certificates. Uh, so one of the fun things that you get to do when you are at the level of vice president of academic affairs is you, you get to go to Wyoming Community College Commission meetings. <laughs> And how many of you enjoy board of trustee meetings that occur here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, glad, glad to see that. <laughs> thank you, Judy, and thank you, Joe. <laughs> and I'm a little concerned about this. <laughs> um, how many of you have attended a board of trustee meeting here? Okay, and therefore we know that once you attend, unless you absolutely have to come back, you don't make a regular habit of it. And I'll just share with you that the Wyoming Community College Commission um, board meetings 
art lasts much longer, and uh, probably the conversation is is not um, as robust as what we see at our own board of trustee meetings. In any case, after attending a board of uh, a community college commission meeting, and this is actually the, the pre meeting where trustees have a little bit more open about their discussion and conversation. I heard the one of the trustees say, as they were talking about a new program, well, I don't know why we're doing this. Why do we have to do this? This is something that's already part of that other program, and didn't we approve that two or three years ago? And they were told, yes, we did. And, but you know, this is coming before you, so this is just the background on it. Well, I took that back and I said, you know, we live in an age where if we can streamline our processes, and make things a little bit simpler, we ought to do it. And so um, engaged the Academic Affairs Council in that conversation and said, this is what I heard the trustee vendors say. They said, if we have a pre-existing program of 60 credits, and Monica's coming forward to me now and saying, out of those 60 credits, I want to create a 20 credit certificate. And it would work really well because there's some folks who just want that certificate and they want to go right out there and get that job, while other folks want to continue on for the full AAS degree. And what I heard from the Academic Affairs Council is that's, that's a great idea. Like, that's a great idea. If that's the case, we would never have to get full approval for a certificate that's already embedded in an approved program. We would just need to go through this body and the actual um, program committee at the WCCC level. So that's still in process. Um, at that level, things move on a, on a little bit of a slower scale. But that's one of the things that um, I wanted to highlight as far as the work that I do in those other areas. Advisory committees. Uh, this is something from my background uh, that I believe wholeheartedly, and this is part of that quality improvement process. We have to hear from stakeholders what they need, what they want, where we can improve, and this is where we do it with advisory committees. We just launched our handbook. The academic leadership team worked on that over the course of the summer, and we have um, a few programs across campus that are piloting it, but the expectation, of course, is that um, all programs have well-developed advisory committees so that they can get that feedback to help them improve. We already know that as a result of the work that we've been doing over the last year and a half, we have over 30 plus articulations. So we're doing a really good job there and we're looking at new program development. And that again is part of the, the mission of what we do in academic affairs. Where are the needs in the community and the workforce? Let's make sure we develop those programs so that our students can get out there and meet those needs. Workforce and development, uh, I want to emphasize when it comes to leadership um, how important this area it is because oftentimes people just think that um, the Vice President of Academic Affairs only deals with academic issues and that's not the case. Um, we have another arm to what we provide at this institution. And it really is that connection from the <coughs> K through 14, 16 level, community college, university, workforce. And it is that workforce and development area that helps us to bridge all of those connections and make sure that we're serving our population. Um, so I just wanted to call out a few things. We've, we've offered over 213 customized trainings, 2,000 participants, affected 165 businesses. We are a community college. This is what we do. We work in the community. Our impact is in the community. It's very important that we have those types of um, outcomes. Transitions for students, high school programs, ACES, which is our adult education, PDP. This is our alternative high school diploma program that we have for those students that perhaps aren't quite able to get through the traditional high school system. Um, so we offer that right here. Uh, that's, that's huge, it's amazing, it's what we need to do, and of course life enrichment. We know that of the students that we have come on this for life enrichment opportunities like C. And I want to 
or um, let you know that I did uh, hold a session with SEEK participants and we looked at learning styles. And I was teaching them about learning styles and it was great. They learned a lot. They, they had a wonderful um, experience. But it's through those interactions with those students that we bring them in the door later. And already our data tells us that over 60% of the students that we have go through programs, they end up coming here. First foot in the door translates into a very familiar environment. They're ready to take that next step. So that's uh, some of the great leadership strategies that we need to continue. Um, with our high schools, just to uh, continue on that note, we have a shared agenda that we've been working off of. We're looking at curriculum alignment. Uh, I'm happy to say that we're getting very, very close to say that if when students take Algebra 2 in high school, it equates to our 0980 math. And that means a lot when it comes to uh, what we do with those students when they're admitted. Sorry. I'm sorry? <laughs> oh. <laughs> My phone was talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Gary. That's okay. Um, we want to increase our dual and concurrent enrollment. Uh, we're working right now, we just filed our HLC extension for our concurrent enrolled in, um, faculty at the high school level, which will allow us the opportunity to work with them to get them the courses that they need in order to meet our credentialing requirements. And of course, we have to be very proud of the fact that we are the only community college in the state of Wyoming that stays up accredited. Um, that's the gold standard for concurrent enrollment. So um, very good work on the part of the the team that has facilitated that process. Uh, we're looking at data sharing and support. We want to make sure that um, as students transition from the high school to us, that we know a little bit more about them, uh, that we're better able to meet their needs when they walk in the door. Compass replacement, one of those leadership strategies, and I think uh, a lot of you are familiar with this, but this was a very involved process. Uh, we had lots of meetings. We had lots of informational meetings on what it was all about, what we were trying to do. Where was the need? The need was compass was going away. <laughs> we had to come up with something. Uh, but we took the time to sit down with folks and talk about you know, how we might approach this. Uh, we got the evidence from the, the folks in the different discipline areas to help guide us with what we could use, and we ultimately ended up with two testing um, systems, Alex as well as McCann, that as, as far as we know right now are working well. We're doing more data collection to make determinations on the placement strategies we've used, if they really have been as accurate and as predictive as we had hoped. So that's coming down the line. Uh, math refresher, uh, that was something that came out of this conversation. It was a pilot program this summer where um, we had a group of students come in and we used the Alex because we knew that if students, based on the data from Alex, if students came in and worked within that venue and it's all computer, online, math, tutoring and training and testing, we knew that given the data that we were provided, if they spent at least 10 hours or more, they were usually which could mean they end up in a college level course versus a developmental level course. And when we talk about the completion agenda, we talk about less time and cost to your degree, it's important. So APR revision, I think a lot of you have um, uh, heard a bit about the academic program review process. And, you know, we looked at that, we took feedback from uh, faculty when they ran through that process that first year and we said, let's streamline this. We um, worked with a administrative as well as a faculty team, spent a lot of time discussing what, where we could go with it, how it would work, and came up with a streamlined process. And that streamlined process actually uh, formed the foundation <coughs> for the service and support program reviews that were coming down um, throughout the so uh, provided assistance with the process. Uh, I'd like to believe, and 
And I hope that um, that you've seen this by me in action. Um, I am a participatory leader. I collaborate with folks, but I but I want to also understand what's required of you. Um, and so when I have opportunities to work on APR and so on, I, I will take those opportunities to better understand the process. And when I see that you have a need, I will go uh, and, and move forward and do what I need to do on my end to provide you the support that you need. And of course, accountability. Um, BAS degree, Bachelor of Science degree. These are some more um, important leadership strategies. We just had a meeting, whoops. Well, that, somehow I did that, let's see. We will go back. of applied science degree, we're looking at collaborating with um, University of Wyoming on this. Just <coughs> sat down with Allison Hayden and Patrice Noel yesterday, um, and they said, we're open to this. Please talk to us. We said, we'd like to have some tracks. Maybe a track in um, a health option for this. Maybe a track that looks at our technical um, uh, CTE program and what that might look like, look like for them. And they're very open to so um, these are the types of uh, efforts that we want to continue with and articulate with the university with. Know that we're leading the state when it comes to transfers. 28% of our students are transferring over to UW. That's more than any of our other sister colleges. Um, as you can see, ag, business, education, health sciences, uh, those are some of the stronger programs, transfer programs. Uh, where we're sending more students to UW. And the good news is when they leave us, they leave us with a 3.0 GPA. And they are doing really well at UW. And the transfer information we get confirms that. So when I look at the constituents and I look at our primary stakeholders, um, students are so critical to what we do. And so I just want to call out some of the um, <coughs> strategies and the opportunities that we've taken advantage of and put in place. One of them is polls. So we know that when we bring students here to campus, we have to give them some background and give them a foundation and an understanding of the basics of what's expected of them. We know that as we work with students, we want to always reference our um, course success rates. And right now, on average, for last year, we bumped up our success rates by a few percentage points, up to 77.36 on average across all of our courses. We have a 1 to 14 ratio of faculty to student, um, generally speaking, on average. Uh, that's, these are excellent uh, pieces that we have in place at this point. And then, of course, we're really um, aligning our programs so students are <coughs> successful in them. We're looking at that persistence piece, making sure that they're actually going to complete in conversations right now with UW about the transfer agenda, knowing that they have that opportunity for students. When you enroll in a transfer program here, you, you can, if you opt in, automatically um, be uh, accepted at UW, waive the application fee. That isn't necessarily translating into a lot of students actually persisting and taking advantage of that. So working with UW is saying, how can we improve that process? What's the type of communication that we can have to help our students as they move forward? When I work with faculty, I, um, I want to call out Center for Teaching and Learning because I think it's just so foundational as we bring new faculty in, we want them to understand the culture, we want them to understand our processes and systems, and we know that not all of our faculty come to us having worked at a college. Some of them come to us out of healthcare institutions, out of technical um, environments. We want to be able to give them what they need so that they can succeed in their work and also help our students succeed. 
We've created a faculty handbook to do that. Um, and we are actually reviewing the Center for um, Teaching and Learning to determine is there some level where we can um, modify that three credit release requirement for new faculty. So open to looking at how that could work um, for folks that have some of those competencies <coughs> and skills already. Professional development for our faculty, critical. We want to make sure that folks um, keep up with their discipline area, but also keep up in areas where they um, believe they have a need for improvement. Credentialing, we have our new um, faculty credentialing policy and procedure in place, and we're already going through that system. We have implemented the Credential Review Committee on at least a handful of cases where we've had reviews completed, and we either have found faculty that will need an education plan or found faculty to meet the requirements <coughs> by virtue of alternative credentialing. That opens up a huge opportunity for us because it goes back to this concept that the degree doesn't always indicate competency and expertise. There are other ways to achieve that. And this is one way that we have identified that. And then of course, we'll see um, coming up next semester, we'll be, uh, continuing on with the process for faculty advancement and ranking and um, utilizing the competencies along with that structure. So, staff. Um, just a lot of uh, um, pictorial representations here, but I think that some of our, um, some of us forget sometimes that it's, it's those folks that are uh, behind the desk, the administrative assistants, um, course coordinators, the the individuals that are handling the, the billing end, the contract end, all of those folks are critical to what we do and how we can deliver our services. So um, as we work to develop, support, assist, and um, recognize those folks, uh, we improve the institution and, and what our mission is. Academic leadership team. Um, I think that I have a very collaborative leadership style uh, with the team, and I believe that I can provide guidance and coaching which, which is needed, but I rely on them to help me understand where we need to go with our strategic planning, um, where we need to innovate. That's absolutely necessary, and then of course the accountability end. Once we've set our targeted goals, are we meeting them? What else do we need to do to improve? Executive team, again, um, very collaborative. I look at the budget and the core and what we did with that and the tough decisions that we made and the fact that we needed to um, provide the evidence, collect the evidence, analyze the evidence, and make decisions uh, based on that. The fact that we looked for um, support from boots on the ground and revenue committees and looking at efficiency committees to say, what else can we do? Uh, that, I think, is critical and I think that's Certainly one of the aspects that makes this institution a, a great institution is that we use that type of collaboration. Um, emergency response, uh, I like to think that in, in this role you may not know this, but when Joe is off campus or he's gone and we can't reach him, um, when we have emergencies, it comes to my level next to step in. And so I take that very seriously. We've had an opportunity to to run through some of those scenarios and see how that works, and, and I believe I have the capacity um, to, to help and manage in those situations. Data-informed decision-making, we've already talked about that. Future growth, of course, is critical to the sustainability and the viability of this institution. Partnerships are critical. Um, most of you know that over 50% of our funding comes from the state. That is an anomaly across the nation most community colleges and even universities that are public um, have dropped considerably the amount of uh, revenue that they are able to get from the state. I strongly believe in our partnerships, the fact that we have to maintain them, nurture them, and encourage them. Um, but, and I probably should have made community a little bit larger in this slide. Um, I think community is the core of the community college. And I think what we provide to the community has to be very open, it has to be um, reiterated, and we have to celebrate it. 
because we get tax support dollars from them. And my work on the city commission said, you have to be accountable to your constituents for the way you spend your money. And if you can't come forward and explain why you did this or that, um, then they lose trust in, in what you're able to do for them. So very much, um, I was a part of the building forward uh, process and, and campaigned and, and helped with that whole process and, and now we see Flex Tech and now we see Pathfinder as a result and I think those are two uh, great demonstrations of what the community can do when they understand their needs. Um, employees, and, and, or, I'm sorry, employers, uh, another partnership that's so critical, again, we loop them in through our advisory committees and the foundation. They give us over a half a million dollars. And if you think about um, our students, they get over $2.25 million in just scholarship and grant assistance. So we do a tremendous job, but we need to make sure that we continue that. So. Um, LCCC, I believe in shared governance. I believe through the process of shared governance, we articulate and understand our shared goals, and I believe that ultimately that translates down to why we exist, and that's for our students and student success. Future for LCCC, here's some of the highlights that I think that are important that you know. Um, we need to work on the academic master plan, already touched on that programming, recruitment, all the aspects of what that means. Know that this is, is critical. We're still in the process of this. CBE is competency-based education. Still in the process of giving, getting approval for that through the Higher Learning Commission. And we're pretty much cutting edge with that. There's, um, there's uh, a, a real need now to understand that Folks can come in with skill sets that they can demonstrate, and they, de they don't always need to sit in the seat and be able to, to show you that they already have that competency. And we're applying that when we look at faculty as far as Center for Teaching and Learning and Faculty Release. So that is one of our overarching goals. Scheduling, talked about that, student persistence. I am um, excited to work with student services. We have a couple of folks there who went to a conference where they did a lot of in-depth uh, work on student persistence, so um, it will be really important for us to uh, take advantage of that knowledge and work forward. Um, faculty competencies, we talked about that. Efficiencies, restructuring and stabilization. So coming off of core, coming off of budget reductions, it will be critical for us as we look to reorganize, um, reshift some of the things that we've been doing. Are there more efficient ways for us to do things? We know that through Core Initiative, a lot of folks came back to us and said, just by virtue of the fact that I've had to do the narratives and fill all that out, I realized um, a, a, a whole lot more about what I do and how I might be able to do it better. So we'll be looking at taking those things and and rolling those out and, and making some of those modifications. Um, we're looking at the budgetary requirements, whether it's release time or part time, um, how we can make that work and still be able to do the good work that we need to do. And looking at revenue enhancements. And I know that Rakshi is a, a strong proponent for this as well as Mary Ellen, but looking at the BOCES agreement, another potential revenue source that will help us um, sustain what we do into the future. So with that, I thank you very much and believe there's time for some questions. Did everybody get that? It's 12, 15 to 1, 30. So as you're putting your calendars together for spring, um, this is the time to say that's when we want to schedule school meetings, committee meetings, and such, because we're more
more likely to get folks during that time frame. Thanks for asking that. Other questions? Yes, Sarshi. Um, so we know lots of changes are coming. Um, so specifically about release time, I know some faculty do a lot of things based on that. How will you help balance taking away release time but still providing um, those opportunities um, wherever they happen to be? Do you expect that same level of services to be provided and just picked up by faculty and staff? Or do you expect to reduce some of those? Um, the good question. Uh, we're still in the throes of uh, reviewing the release time allocations as they exist right now. We've looked at some of the release, and I think that one of them, um, uh, we've, we've said, you know, that really looks like service. Uh, it wasn't a lot of release that was allocated towards it, uh, but we said that really could be service. And then as we talked about adopting an honors program, which is something that you'll be hearing about, we actually said that actually seems a project that's related to an honors program, um, if we implemented it in that way. So we're looking at um, everything at this point through a lens of, um, is this a requirement of program? Is it important that a program has these activities in order to persist? The second thing we look at is, is this something that um, is, that is nice to do, but maybe we could live without? And finally, um, is this something that actually could be considered service? And we know that with our new faculty position descriptions, we say that five to 10 percent of the faculty's role should be in service. So we look at that and say, could is this something that could potentially move into that realm? I might be missing something. Is there anything else, release committee folks, that we looked at as far as making some of those decisions? Criteria. Like, oh yes, and then and then some of the release time allocations are actually embedded in position descriptions. So for instance, that occurs a lot in the health science arena. So if we hire Adrian as a program director, there's no point in giving her release. She is the program director. Those, those responsibilities are built into her job. So some of it is just clarifying uh, some of those things that have occurred over time. So good question. Thank you, Arshi. Any other questions? <laughs> through core and we already took a look at KPIs and we already look, took a look at all of our academic programs and as Joe has articulated because we have so much data that we've already collected when it comes to our programs so um, we we basically have started the process already we knew and the executive team said that that in and of itself was not going to decide um, where programs in the long term because as Joe has articulated we knew that if there are programs that maybe aren't at the level that we want them to be are there things we need to do to help support them do we need to connect them to admissions so that we have better recruitment done um, do we need to connect them with the employers so that while this program may have originally been formed to um, meet a certain skill set uh, over time, that skill set has changed. And maybe we're not meeting what the industry actually needs. And so we need to make some modifications. So we will, um, 
we will continue to look at that. But as you saw in the um, slide on academic master plan, that also is part of what that planning um, process would be, is developing the structures for uh, really evaluating and, and making sure that we have a good system in place when we are going to develop new programs in the academic program. You discussed uh, uh, the single professional learning uh, the qualification for faculty for the process and why those competencies are needed and so forth. And then you also talk about ranking. And I would like to ask if you see a similarity between both processes in the fact that there may be faculty who have been working here for a long time and may have acquired those competencies that will make them available to get to those ranking positions, so what are going to call it and so forth. The same way that you were going to do new faculty who may have not been in the academic setting, but you know, they kind of there for whatever, they were able to get those competencies. Can you comment on that? Oh, I think that's a great uh, question, and I think that your analysis is correct. Um, there's Probably we can ask you during our thing. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking. Uh huh. Oh, well, time for one more question. Thing. Anybody else? You know, it's just me being so obnoxious. Right now. I'm a resident liner. I'm terribly sorry. Sometimes I wonder if we aren't cutting a few too many edges, um, a little too fast for you know people. <laughs> and that. Um, I, I get that you're in it, that Joe's in it, and he wants the best. And I, I want that too. I want us to give the best to our students. But every once in a while, we feel overwhelmed. Yeah. I, I think that you have a very valid point. And I think that's something that, um, at, at, that I reflect on. And I know, um, I, I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds, but I, I know that even the executive team reflects on this. Um, you know, how, how can we do this better? Uh, sometimes, like with core, it's an emergent need. You don't have time to say, well, let's just think about this for a year, and then all of a sudden, now you have to, at the drop of a dime, start, start cutting things left and right. Uh, so sometimes you have to make those decisions really quickly. Uh, but we're already um, talking about, is, is there a different approach so that Change is just an essential component of life. Would you all agree? I mean, if we're going to survive, we have to adapt, and adapt means change. Um, but how we go about it and the, the system that we have in place is going to be critical. And I think that we, we all talk about this and recognize that um, we probably need to step back and see if, if, you know, how are we doing it? Could we do it better? Um, because I, you're not the only one that's expressed We that. need episodes of homeostasis. <laughs> it means a change. <laughs> you know, something that resembles that. Um, well, and, and you know, you and I could have a long conversation about homeostasis because quite frankly, I think even from a, from a medical point of view, there's not much homeostasis anymore, even within, within the body and the regular routine things that the body does. So, um, but anyway, that's a whole nother. And on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Any last questions? I heard well, Connie real quick. Okay, real quick. Um, just kind of piggybacking on Marine because I'm a fan of the next two. Um, <laughs> have you thought about a college master calendar for oh. for things that have that are due every year at the same time, but <laughs> some new people?
people may not be aware that they're always due at the same time every year. Well, thanks to your team, um, because she's really been spearheading this. I, I think that she's come through to the academic leadership team on a couple of occasions and said, boy, it's easy to get lost. You know, there's so many things that are happening, so many things that are due. We've actually talked about this um, at the executive level. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I think it's difficult to break it down to what needs to be there. And if you put everything there, is it going to take you, you know, forever just to, to, you know, two pages just to go through one day? So the logistics of how that works, um, I, I don't know that we have that figured out, but I know that some deans uh, have created their own school calendars. And I think that that has been really helpful because um, that helps their constituents know exactly what's important for them in that near term. We have an alt calendar, and we did that specifically so that we, all of our academic leadership team, would stay on track with what we needed to do. And it can be done within Outlook. Um, so if you're on various different uh, levels, committees, um, organizations, you may have several tabs that you'd have to shift through to, to see everything on there. But there, there is a way to do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, join me in thanking Terry for her interest in it. <laughs> And ACC folks, hang on. We'll let people transition out and then make sure Terry's transition.